we we all have had experience and this might be a good place to to start out our our discussion today by the way welcome everybody i didn't get to say hello to everybody but um all of us have had some kind of an experience in one place or time where we have felt uh the presence of of god's spirit and it has moved us and it has um has changed us um and, and I think a lot of uh, good comes from going back to those times and asking um, what was going on in, in my life at that particular time that made me um, prone to be acceptable of what was taking place. And a, a, a lot of times we, we forget what, <laughs> what even the event was. We remember the feeling more than we remember the event or the, 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 the message. And I, I had a, a, a youth minister one time at camp tell me um, as a kid, and it stuck with me all the time. He, he asked after a very powerful camp experience we'd had, well, did you have a, 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 an experience with God? And we'd all go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he said, I don't believe you. And we said, what? You know, how, how dare you uh, devalue our experience at this camp? And he said, I, I don't believe you unless something happens in your life and and he said that the spirit of god doesn't just prompt us to feel good the spirit of god prompts us to do good and he said if you want to prove to me that you had an experience with god then show me the fruit show me what happens as a result because god only connects with us to further god's will and so that is a really good jumping off place for us to go into our, our experience here together. And I'm going to start up my screen here. Share screen. So today our theme is Living Hope. It's our, our last day and we're going to maybe connect all these pieces together that we've gone over these uh, last few days and and share together um there are a few things that we need to have for today's um class and you can get them on the um the sign in page for today's class so if you don't have them um the, the first one is the world world conference resolution uh 1224 and 1312. that's a downloadable document on that site and we'll talk about those resolutions as, as uh, we come up to them in class. And the other one is um, this document on the Green Congregation. Um, I, I'm going to put that on the screen when we come to it, but it also is a great download for you to use in your congregation uh, about talking how you can be a, a better Green Congregation. Um, but we're going to start now with uh, the Gather experience today and uh, share from Doctrine and Covenants 163.2. Let's, let's share together in, in God's uh, word to us today. Jesus Christ, the embodiment of God's shalom, invites all people to come and receive divine peace in the midst of the difficult questions and struggles of life. Follow Christ in the way that leads to God's peace and discover the blessings of all the dimensions of salvation. Above all else, strive to be faithful to Christ's vision of the peaceable kingdom of God on earth. Courageously challenge cultural, political, and religious trends that are contrary to the reconciling and restoring purposes of God. Pursue peace. I'd like you to look over that and try to discover words that jump out in that piece of scripture to you today. Take a few minutes to breathe those in. And with everyone's microphone on mute, I invite you to read out loud the scripture again 
in the place you are. Do that now. And breathe in one more time and out. And now I would invite anyone who would like to share what jumped out at them in the scripture and just wave your hand and I'll thumb through the, the pictures. Yes, go ahead, Kathy Baker. The, uh, the line where it said in the midst of the difficult questions, Mm -hmm. uh, just uh, shortly ago on the uh, Beyond the Walls, John DeLenn came on. Um, he's, oh, John. he's an LDS uh, yes. person. And he just uh, completely gobsmacked me and, and some other people by saying about how the community of Christ has gone through problems. And, and he said, through. <laughs> Uh, and dealt with things to do with race, gender equality, historical honesty, integrity, ecclesiastical authority, e exclusivity, sexual orientation, poverty, and peace. And he says, we are now looking to you because uh, you've gone through it. And I just thought, you know, wow, I hadn't thought about that as as uh, as a church that we had just dealt with everything and it, and and there's been a lot of pain and he recognized that but he said the pain was worth it mm -hmm. yeah and, and and in some ways we're still going through it and and i hope that we do because um the the difference between being the church that had all the answers to becoming the church that is, are asking the right questions is is a traumatic experience, and and um, it, it 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 takes someone. I I, I worked with a minister. When I was a, a part of a, a clergy union in Columbia, Missouri, and I worked with a minister who was renting our church space on Saturdays for his congregation, and it was a denomination that had. Uh, broken apart. They had just set women uh, to be free to uh, join their priesthood. And, um, and they had been doing this over a period of, I think it was 20 years. And we, this was in the uh, early to mid 90s. And he came to me and he said, how did you folks change your mind at one conference? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, we didn't change our mind in one conference. And, and he said, but the, the fact that you, you were here and you went to here in a relatively short period of time. And I said, yeah, well, we lost a lot of people. He said, we did too, but we lost them over the 20 years. And, and, um, and we began to talk to each other about what it me meant to change our minds change our own personal minds into a new understanding of what it meant to be a, a Christian, a disciple of Jesus. And I think we're still doing that. I hope we're still doing that because um, I know my Christianity after uh, uh, COVID-19 has changed a bit because my, my understanding of the world has changed a little bit. And so with every change that we see taking place, we, we ask these questions that are, are here in 163. I really think this is a key scripture to us right now in asking, you know, what are the, what are the other changes? What are the political, religious trends, cultural trends that are still affecting us today? Okay, who else? Uh, raise your hand and I'll 
zip through again. Anybody else have a comment on this? I'm not seeing anybody with their hand up. Yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead, John. Uh, struggles of life uh, certainly stood out for me as well. Um, when I read it, I, I was thinking outside of the church uh, to some of the political struggles uh, and the uh, uh, cultural struggles that we are going through presently due to the uh, uh, pandemic uh, that, that we have. Uh, I, I also uh, reflect on, uh, on the conference that we had last fall, and um, Ruth and I just happened to uh, be in the vicinity where uh, President Vizi was, uh, uh, was sitting. And I made a comment to him that it, it, it must be difficult to walk the, uh, the path between uh, the... Uh, uh, the more radical and the, uh, the liberal uh, or the, the various, various strains that exist in the church mm -hmm. and to try to uh, make sense of it and yet to do so uh, in that uh, peaceful way mm -hmm. uh, we claim to, to represent. And I, 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 I feel for uh, President Vizi in trying to walk that, that difficult path. Yeah. The struggle of life. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, David? The, the phrase that is standing out to me is above all else. It seems as though, regardless of the struggles, regardless of where we are, above all else, be faithful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, Mary Jean? And for me, it's the next word. <laughs> Strive. It's, it's like, it's not saying, you must be faithful, <laughs> thou shalt. Yeah. It's strive. And to me, that's like, I know that you're not going to always be faithful, but strive. Work on it. Good. Anyone else? Yes, go ahead, Nancy. No, you got your microphone off. There you are. Okay. This word stuck out for me also, Mary Jean, and the one thing I gathered from it is we never arrive. Mm -hmm. That we're always striving, and it's something that we constantly work on because there isn't a day I can say, wow, I've made it, I'm there. Yeah, and at the same time, we get little pieces of it, don't we? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good. Susan? For me, the word is God, because I'm just kind of coming out of a, a dark night of the soul. So I'm um, trying to reconnect. <laughs> so the word God um, is, is um, speaking to me. If, if you don't have to redefine the word God a few times in your life, you're not doing... Uh... You're not doing serious spiritual contemplation. Um, the term God has a lot of baggage on it. And, and sometimes it is others' interpretation of God, which is not our understanding of God. Or it's sometimes beyond our comprehension. And we, so, so there is a, a scripture in, uh, uh, in, in one of the epistles that says, uh, relinquish your pondering and fall on your knees. And to me, at times, I have, I have done all the theology that I can stand, and I recognize it's still not enough. And that is the time where I worship, <laughs> is that I recognize that there is this love that is greater than my own that still relentlessly calls after me so yeah feel, feel comfortable in your struggle susan 
Anyone else? Yes, go ahead. Um, oh, your microphone's not on. I, I know, but hey. I, I, and I, I couldn't find it. <laughs> <laughs> for me, it's, okay. it's, it's for me. It's, Dorothy, you go ahead, Dorothy. It's Ruth here. Oh, hi, Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just said go ahead, and everybody went. <laughs> And I couldn't find my mic. <laughs> I have an <laughs> iPad and it disappears every now and again. Um, for me, it's courageously challenge because mm. for me, the, in the whole courageously challenge, I mean, there's a lot of things that need challenging. And for me, it's the sacredness of creation that stands out because where are we going to be if we don't look after our world? And I feel really badly how intelligent some of the animals are. And look at, we've destroyed their world. <laughs> yep. I was, I, I was going to say the word that stands out to me is come mm. and receive divine peace. And uh, just as, as little as a few weeks ago, um, some of the things that I was seeing on television and hearing and reading on Facebook were very, very disturbing to me. And I yeah. was not in a peaceful place. And then I came across this quote to uh, contemplate says don't let people pull you into their storm pull them into your peace uh, and so you have to work at that peace within uh, yourself to find that peace and it really it really helped to turn things around for me in the way i was feeling goodness wow <laughs> Lots of good stuff, folks. Um, uh, yeah, Larry uh, sent a chat too saying, uh, Larry Buchanan said, the whole line that each of you are sharing words from focuses me on Christ's mission is our mission. Um, really good thoughts there, folks. Uh, we could, gosh, we spent 20 minutes on this. <laughs> and and um, yeah, I, I, I would encourage you to journal a little bit more with this particular uh, passage. It is, it's got a lot of feet to it, and I really have, uh, I really have found some some good things from it. Um, we're going to move ahead into our class itself, and um, I've got to move everybody's faces here so I can read this. Oh, there we go. So uh, again, from the book that uh, we're we're getting most of this uh, stuff from is the uh, the Way of Life by Tony Shavala Smith, and I thought I still had it near me, but I don't. Um, it is available on uh, Harold House's site in both a uh, uh, ebook and uh, in a hard copy. So today, this is one of the quotes I, I pulled out of it: uh, Generosity must also extend beyond actions into our attitudes towards others and the planet. To belittle the poor for their situation is cruel and contrary to the spirit of Jesus. To protect ourselves from the cries of those who suffer is to wall off our hearts to God's own tears. To refuse to, let, uh, to use less in our endangered world is to work against the renewal of, earth, of the earth. To withhold one gifts when they would make a difference to the work of God's reign is to miss an opportunity to embody the revolutionary vision of Jesus. Um, so we're seeing from our, our uh, work here the, the last couple of weeks in, in uh, discovering you know, the, the, the path that God is placing us on as disciples is that the nature of God being one of generosity towards humanity and towards creation uh, is also asking us as somewhat sentient beings to also pay attention, to, to recognize uh, those who have been uh, without mercy um, belittled and, and disregarded. And also that that extends to creation. And that we as disciples have got to recognize that if God is generous to us, we also must be generous to our circle of influence. And, and I've, I've really been playing with the idea of what is, um, 
what is my, we talk about our carbon footprint, but what is my spiritual footprint? What is the, uh, the amount of influence that I have personally to help other people um, uh, create behaviors that are more in keeping with, uh, with what God would move us toward? And, um, and, and I've discovered, first of all, for me personally, there is no better influence I have than those who are closest to me. So my family is part of that. I, uh, how I work with and shape and, and uh, maintain relationships with those who are close within my family. But then there's my, my church family and, and my congregation and how, how every time I'm behind the pulpit that I have the opportunity to encourage and to move and to uh, help others in their walk as disciples. And, and then it ex extends to those people that I come in contact on the periphery somehow, um, whether it's at a Costco or if it's at the gas station or you know uh, wherever I'm, I'm having a, a, a contact with people, am I? really helping continue to make my spiritual pro, uh, footprint uh, felt. Um, I, I don't know if the musical uh, Al Alexander Hamilton is, uh, has made an impact anywhere in Canada, nor should it, but um, a wonderful musical um, about a, a statesman in the United States um, who really uh, was one of the most influential people in the making of my country, but his name is pretty well not known. He never became a president, uh, never became uh, you know, anything beyond um, what the many things that he touched in, in his lifetime. And there's a song at the very end, and its, and its title is, Who Lives, Who Dies, Who Tells the Story? Um, and, and it goes through the people at, uh, at the end of the story, pretty much all the protagonists are, are dead, except for Alexander Hamilton's wife, Eliza. And they sing that she lived another uh, 45 years after her husband died. And her influence was to keep his memory of what he had done alive. In other words, she had spent her first half of her life kind of as an, uh, a secondary person in the story, and the rest of her second part of her life was spent telling the story. And I've, I've really been contemplating on that, of, of what impact. Her life didn't have much of an impact until her husband died and she became the holder of the story. And I think all of us as disciples are really the holders of the story. We get to influence how the story is told and how we share it with others and how we make it relevant in other people's lives. So the question comes up is, what is our spiritual footprint? What is our, um, our influence um, around what we do and how everything is spiritual. This is one of the cool things about the restoration movement is we were one of the first Christian churches to say everything was created spiritually. Um, everything has this connection of spirit to the creator. And therefore, all of it is part of the importance of what the word salvation we've been using has to do with our relationship to each other. So here is where Tony is really talking about, you know, it extends to, to especially the poor. That was G one of Jesus' biggest focus, the d disenfranchised people. Um, and and the, there are only two groups of people that Jesus really had harsh words for. Um, one were the, the people who treated children badly, <laughs> and the second were religious leaders of which we are all part of that group. <laughs> so we, we recognize the place we're in can not only cause great effects spiritually, but if we as, as religious leaders use it to our advantage rather than to God's advantage, we can do harm to people spiritually too. And we must always be aware of, of how that is, is being felt. 
I'm, I'm going to go to the next slide real quick. I know there's a lot more to talk about on that. Um, and, and he goes on further to say, say, Community of Christ believes the risen Lord has called us to pursue peace and establish the cause of Zion. We, and we can say that the, the kingdom of God and, and the, the cause of Zion too. We understand the call to share the peace of Jesus Christ in all its personal, interpersonal, community, and worldwide dimensions. So of all parts of our life, we experience that as disciples. As Easter restored the broken community of the disciples, and, and I want you to think of that as Easter, which, and, and, and don't think of it as the Easter we experience, think of it as the first Easter experience where the disciples were traumatized and hiding in rooms because they were fearing that they were the next to be crucified. As Easter restored the broken community of disciples, so the cause of Zion calls us to promote local and worldwide communities that signal the peaceful reign of God on earth by working to mend neighborhoods, nations, and nature. And so that's where we find ourselves today asking the question, how would you describe what it means to share the peace of Christ in all these dimensions? What does it look like in your life and your congregation and community? So that, that's, a, that's one of the way up high questions. How do we do this? And then we get into more of the specifics. Living Jesus, Prince of Peace, Living Hope, to care for our planet, to be makers of peace and friends of justice for the poor and marginalized is to embody creation's first, uh, future in this present moment. Um, this is where we begin to ask the questions, okay, what is my footprint and how can I make it more meaningful? Um, if you have uh, available to you, well, I don't want to get, get into that yet, but I, I, I'd like to have us stop for a minute and, and do some sharing in regard to earth stewardship. Um, Within the last 20 years, a number of our World Conference resolutions have been about um, the ecology and earth stewardship and our part in it. It's really one thing to pass a, um, a resolution in the church, but it's another thing to see that being affected to us personally and what we are doing. Um, in the uh, resource Choose Generosity, it says, we must actively engage in efforts that heal the earth and its inhabitants and protect them from further damage. How we treat the earth is part of our faithful response to a loving God who has provided us creation in the beginning and made us stewards over its care. So I'd like us, um, Mary Jean, uh, for, for just uh, 10 minutes, so we are at uh, two minutes after, so somewhere around 12 after, we'll, we'll come out of this. In about groups of three or four at the most, um, share a, a bit together, what is the greatest environmental threat in your community? Um, and are there political challenges to that? So, so discuss for a little bit, what is the bi biggest environmental issue that you can think of and, and um, what can be done? What can be done individually and through your congregation to, to, um, to bring that to uh, an understanding or do something about it? So let's break off into groups for just a little bit and share what those are. All right. Well, welcome back, everybody. I hope we had some, some good discussion in regard to Earth Stewardship. Um, I'm going to refer you now to the screen we have here, 1992 conference uh, supported uh, resolution 1224, which establishes the Earth Stewardship Team as a standing committee. And the team focuses on issues of environment and development and gives guidance to the church. Um, I, I've got this document and I'm gonna pull this up. Uh, if I pull this up, I'm gonna change my stop share. So this is the, uh, the web page uh, on headquarters that is the uh, Earth Stewardship Committee. 
and you can see that there are um, always updated things going on. Here's a, an article on fracking, uh, Earth Day, 50th anniversary, there's more information on the stewardship team. Uh, an old thing about recycling hymnals uh, back when we were getting new hymnals. Um, this is a, a place where there are resources that uh, might help your congregation in uh, better understanding some issues of earth stewardship and uh, taking some action in your congregation. So I, I recommend that that web page for, for everyone to go to. Um, so, so earth stewardship is both a, a, a worldwide, a national, and a local issue. And I want to keep those things in front of us as, as um, a, a lot of times we feel like we can't do much about worldwide and, and sometimes not even national, but there are a lot of local things that we can do. And um, there's some wonderful resources that are out there to uh, get you uh, in, engaged in that. And one of them was the, uh, the, the document that is on the, um, the class website. Uh, of how to make your congregation uh, better in environmental um, uh, stewardship. And I would suggest after this class, if you haven't done so, to go on that, uh, that site. Oh, it's a, and it's also been shared on, on the chat room, right? Somebody shared that? I need to pull that back up. Yeah, so it's, it's a link that's also yes. on our, our chat room. And I would, I would highly recommend you go through that. It, it is... Um, it, it's it, there's a lot you can do, and there's a lot your congregation can do, and um, and talk about taking steps in your congregation to be one of those signal communities of uh, environmental uh, responsibility. I'm gonna check. I'm seeing chats come in. Yes, it is a huge list, Larry, and um, and we want to make sure that uh, that we know that there are things we can do individually to help uh, these these areas. Um. Beyond earth stewardship, if I can get back into my screen, we, we also are aware of a lot of things locally that promote economic justice. Um, oops, I want to make sure we, sorry, my fingers are getting, and so this is a statement from, from Steve Vesey at the 2016 conference. The world is living a nightmare of pain and despair. God is calling for a massive exodus of people from poverty and related suffering. Will we be the prophets? We could even say, will we be the Moseses standing before crafty politicians and predatory hoarders of wealth saying with conviction, you had better let God's people go. God sees a church that doesn't just speak and sing of Zion. God sees one that lives, loves, and shares as Zion. And the examples, those who strive to be visibly one in Christ, among whom there are no poor or oppressed, inspired by Doctrine and Covenants 165, 6a. The only way there will be no poor or oppressed is for the rest of us to change our ways. Zion is the divine vision that awakens our nobler natures and potential for sharing in community. Uh, it's a powerful statement. Yeah, you know, so are we prepared to be the Moseses, the prophets? Are we really a prophetic people? And when we look at what prophets were, they were people who stood up to power. They were the ones who stood before the Pharaoh and said, these are not your people. You don't own them. Let them go. Be, let them be free. And, and so... We, we have a, a, one 2016 resolute, uh, resolution from World Conference 1312, and it's in uh, one of the downloads that I put on the site. Uh, opposition to predatory loan practices. Um, I'm not sure if Canada is in the same place as the United States, but there are what we call these predatory loan practices. And that is basically, give us your car title and we will give you this uh, uh, the amount of cash that is almost impossible to pay back. And they, they, uh, they feed on the poor to continue to enslave them to these loan practices. 
Um, it's one thing in my country that our church is is looking at and saying this is not right. This is this is a um, this goes against the nature of what humanity should be. So I'm going to ask uh, while we still have a little time here, and I'm going to pull everybody's faces up so I can see them again. Um, is there something in your community that is predatory toward the poor or disenfranchised that um, that you see as being a part of your spiritual footprint, whether it's in your congregation or you personally? Anybody have one of those things? And I'm looking for hands raised. And I'm not seeing anybody with their hands up. Oh, oh was okay. Uh, go ahead, Dorothy. I just got a card in the mail yesterday from Fieldstone offering me all kinds of money and and so yes there are there are places and I see people going in who look like they need a hand up all right and they're going to these places that offer them quick and easy money and how are they going to pay it back yeah yep T Troy well, and uh in in Canada actually several years ago uh, right after, almost pretty much right after that resolution was brought up, was uh, in, in Canada they uh, the, the government did take steps to decrease the percentage of those uh, loans and the term of those loans. That if, if people are having to come back more than three times, then they were allowed to have that extended out over several months to pay it back and get them out of that cycle. So. They're trying to find the fine balance between it. It is a helpful service, but how can they make sure it's not predatory? So the Canadian, well, at least the Ontario government, has taken steps. Uh, it's probably not enough, but it's it's definitely uh, better than it, it is in the states, by to my understanding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Other things? Yes. Go ahead, Susan. I'm not sure if this is exactly what you're asking, but. Our credit card banks, the companies, um, they charge an, an incredible amount of interest for, for credit cards. And mm -hmm. some people, they can just pay the minimum so it goes on and on and on. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Larry. Even the reverse mortgage concept is yes. basically taking our property away and they're never expected to pay for it in our lifetime. So right. here you go. Yep. And that preys on the elderly of our community. Yep. I'm looking for anybody else with hands up. One more time. I'll go. Okay, go ahead, David. In regard to those reverse mortgages, I just heard an interesting financial planner uh, point out uh, positive for, for that in that he says, we have a number of elderly people living in particularly the Toronto area where they have million plus homes that are fully paid for and they've got children who are looking to get into the housing market and can't come up with the down payment. Mm -hmm. And so the parents can take out a reverse mortgage to get the down payment for their children to buy into the high price market. And that's one way that they're able to uh, pass on some of their heritage now versus later whenever they die. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Troy? I just wanted to try and, and respond to the second question there about what ministries or practices address these circumstances. And that brings to mind for me our uh, oblation ministries mm -hmm. and how that opportunity is there to uh, help folks who you know, may have a situation that is temporary or short term and, and oblation conversations can help, uh, you know, redirect them away from those predatory loan uh, companies uh, and where we as a church can help them not only locally but you know if it's larger we can go to the mission center and we have we have done that here uh, in the Berry congregation with a couple of folks and it 
it has helped lift them a little bit uh, out of poverty or at least help them not go deeper into poverty. Yeah. So we, we had a young woman in our congregation who had just uh, a, a, a single mother just given birth to her child and, um, and had fallen behind on her bills uh, for the, the birth from the hospital and had been called into court. And um, our congregation took from its oblation ministries money to pay for uh, the doctor's bill and members of our congregation went to the court to stand with her to tell the judge that the congregation would um would be there to help her and the judge was moved that uh, a church took action not only for this young mother but also uh, in a situation where she could not pull herself out of and by the way, that young woman is very active in the life of the church now um, because she saw the compassion toward her and wanted to respond um, back the same way. Uh, and, 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 and this is, when we ask the reason, what is the purpose for the church to exist? These are some of those purposes. It, not just to pay the money, but to stand with. And this is the spiritual footprints that we're talking about making. Um, who lives, who dies, who tells the story. We are all the ones who are right now living. And we are the ones called to be the bearers of the story and to share that with others. So as our send, uh, I'm going to ask one more time, as, as we've done a few times in this class, um, are we moving toward Jesus, the peaceful one? Are we retreating from Jesus by reverting to our old humanity and its destructive ways of interacting with others in creation? Then let's continue to ask ourselves, what is it that we could say at the end of each one of these statements? I believe, I confess, and I commit. And in the places where you are today, I'm going to ask you one more time if you can put this down on your journal for the next a uh, week. What is it that you believe? What is God calling you toward in your belief? What is it that we still must confess? The things that we still are doing, the practices that we're engaged in that are not pointing us toward Jesus, the peaceful one. And what is the thing that we can commit to at this time in our discipleship? And for our closing today, I'm going to read from uh, Doctrine and Covenants 165 as kind of our closing to our time together. Beloved community of Christ, do not just speak and sing of Zion. Live, love, and share as Zion. Those who strive to be visibly one in Christ, among whom there are no poor or oppressed. As Christ's body, lovingly and patiently bear the weight of criticism from those who hesitate to respond to the divine vision of human worth and equality in Christ. This burden and blessing is yours for divine purposes. And always remember the way of suffering love that leads to the cross also leads to resurrection and everlasting life in Christ's eternal community of oneness and peace trust in this promise. May God bless you as you seek to continue to be disciples of Christ in the place that you are. May your spiritual footprint ever be expanding to affect those others around you. It has been wonderful to be with you folks, even in this strange and weird time and on this strange and weird platform. Uh, thank you for being patient with us as we've uh, tried to, to get through this class. Uh, spend some time with it. Spend some time with your, your notes and your journal. Spend some time with some of the resources that are up on the class. And, um, and, and know that uh, you are a blessed people. Um, keep your congregation in your prayers. And I sure appreciate everybody coming on and we can open up the, the microphones and, and share a little of what we call in our congregation the vestibule time uh, as we're having online sharing uh, going on. But uh, good to have you with us as uh, we've gone through this class. It's been 
it's been really good for me as well as I hope it's been good for you. So um, blessings to everybody.